Many of you know the CA as the aviation safety regulator, and of course, safety is a critical part of our role. But our remit goes well beyond that into economic regulation, consumer rights enforcement, airspace oversight, and financial licensing. And I've been asked to talk today uh, particularly uh, about uh, economic regulatory context and what needs to be done to better protect the overflown from aviation noise. Uh, at the heart of what we do, our statutory duty is to protect consumers and the overflown. And these two issues are intrinsically linked and incredibly challenging, uh, but they will inevitably have to be addressed if a new runway is ever to become more than just a recommendation from yet another airport's commission. I'm not going to offer a view on whether or not the decision to recommend Heathrow or not is the right one. I don't think that's appropriate for an independent regulator, but we have been impressed with what the Commission has produced. And we wholeheartedly agree with the analysis that there is a very compelling case to develop new runway capacity subject to improving aviation's noise footprint on those who are overflown. Why? Well, because without new capacity, it's clear to us, UK consumers are going to suffer consequences through higher charges, less choice and more disruption. Yet even if you accept there's a compelling case for new runway capacity, we know that developing and building it will be far from easy, it's complex and challenging, and moreover, it's not in the hands of any one party, be it HAL, the CAA or government, to unilaterally turn a handle. It's certainly not within the CAA's gift uh, to compel the airport to build and a new runway. Uh, this is the same position for all economic regulators uh, in the UK facing large infrastructure investments. We are rightly creatures of statute. The legal frameworks govern our objectives, the way we work, and what we can do. And they're a reflection of government policy at any one time and the duties we are set by Parliament. Indeed, a key element of where we can add value is in our very independence. Uh, we will set a clear regulatory framework that enables the runway to be developed in users' interests and in the most efficient and cost-effective way. This, of course, is also the case for other regulated sectors. Off-what and off-gem provide stable, predictable frameworks which seek to bear down on tariffs, provide consumers with good quality services, and enable efficient, well-run companies to finance themselves. And indeed, such independent economic regulation is firmly established as one of the critical success factors in the UK economy. At a time of increasing demands for infrastructure, fiscal consolidation and the economic recovery, the expertise, independence, consumer focus and long-term view offered by regulators can make a major contribution to a healthy and growing economy. It's the very long-term independent nature of regulation combined with transparency that is well understood and respected and sought after by investors who have invested in billions of pounds of new infrastructure over the past few decades. This trust and consistency helps bring certainty for investors, which is critical, both in terms of delivering large infrastructure projects and at a lower cost of capital. Now, that's not to say that regimes across energy, water and aviation are identical, but where there are differences, these tend to reflect the particular circumstances in that sector. We are relatively modest and not over ambitious about the limitations of our role. There is, for example, no direct duty in the Civil Aviation Act 2012 for us to facilitate the delivery of a new capacity. That clear direction, policy and firm commitment can only come from government, as it does for major water uh, infrastructure and as it does, for, for example, for nuclear, nuclear power plants. It is, after all, as we have seen played out for decades and in the last few days, and as uh, Andrew Dona so superbly encapsulated this morning, a highly political decision. As regulators, we don't prescribe which large-scale projects should be undertaken and the specific nature of each project. That's the job of the company, alongside the support of investors, but under the umbrella of a clear policy and strategy set by government, with regulators set in the right incentives. We can play our part once that strategy and policy have been defined. Uh, indeed, uh, in March this year, we set out some initial thinking on regulating new capacity in the form of a set of principles. We felt that with the major uncertainty about what expansion would be permitted, and indeed the market context in which it would occur, that principles, rather than a detailed regulatory framework, would be the best and most constructive contribution uh, to progress at this stage. We set out three principles, 
and they were that risk should be allocated to those who can manage it, the capacity can be paid for both before and or after it opens, and the commercial, commercial negotiations should be encouraged. And I want to touch on those three now. Firstly, then, the principle of seeking to allocate risk to those who can manage it best. It ought to be obvious, didn't it? And large infrastructure projects, such as airports, are all about risk, how to price it, how to manage it, who should bear it. The regulator alone certainly can't manage the framework and incentives which adequately manage and allocate all categories of risk, but we can minimise regulatory risk and set a framework that enables economy to be developed and use interests. We also have a good idea of how other risks can be managed. Demand risk, for example. We can support airport airline commercial negotiations to manage demand risk, and the CAA has a role in protecting users and airlines from market power, so that we will look to see that any contracts agreed are fair. Construction, procurement, finance, and operational risk should all be managed by the airport. They are, after all, core competencies for operators who can either manage them directly or outsource and pass some of that risk to subcontractors at a price. But whatever contract arrangements occur, the airport operator as the prime contractor, of course, holds a great deal of that risk. And then there is policy and political risk. It's an area where we do not have the tools to manage risk. We see the government's response to the recommendation as crucial, with airports and airlines keen to see strong support that will ensure the scheme gets off the ground, that it's financed at a reasonable cost, and that it delivers long-term benefits for both users and investors. The airport licence, a key part of any regulatory regime, can play its part in supporting such risk allocation. For example, the licence can reinforce a mandated government airport obligation to build, and it can ensure that appropriate consultation occurs. The licence can also play a role here in reinforcing policy on surface access, ensuring air quality and blight costs are treated appropriately once there's a clear lead from government in these areas. But when we look to other regulated industries, we find the obligations on the operator to build or maintain a certain level of capacity or quality is typically first in legislation, national or international, not least because of the recognised limitations of an economic licence. You know, if the, if the aim is to deliver legitimate political requirements. That's why we believe that there will need to be an architecture of agreements and relationships to manage the risks. The second and perhaps most controversial principle, at least within the industry and between airports and airlines, that is that we are open to pre-funding. Now, the aviation industry meets most of its infrastructure costs through private funding, the vast majority indeed, and regulated airports are no different. And this issue is critical to airlines and passengers. Allowing airports to increase charges to start paying for expansion before a new runway is open could be beneficial to users and investors because it reduces the amount of finance required and brings forward the point where investors are paid back and so reduces the risk and hence the cost of that risk. And by spreading cost over a longer period, the size of the price uplift when the runway opens. How the regulatory system has in the past allowed pre-funding of significant CapEx programs such as Terminals 5 and 2 at Heathrow. The scale of capacity expansion means allowing some pre-funding could well be in users' interests as it has the potential to reduce the overall cost of finance and smooth the price path. That's why we are certainly open to the idea of allowing pre-funding. But we recognise that this is a view that's strongly contested by many airlines for a number of reasons. Not the least of which being that they fear that they and therefore ultimately passengers bear the risk of considerable abortive costs if this or a subsequent government decides not to proceed with the scheme they've already started to pay for. They believe that it's particularly inappropriate given the very long lead time to implementation and their ability to realise the benefits. And, and of course, allied to this, they are concerned that the effect of EU slot regulation might be to effectively require them to pay for new entrants who then have first refusal to new capacity. So uh, we understand those concerns and are conscious that the, this could be a divisive issue. We can to consider them because irrespective of pre-funding, our focus will be to make sure that users pay only for a fair price for new infrastructure and are not asked to bear risks which are better managed by other players in development.
Turning then to the third principle on the role of commercial negotiations and how they can support our approach to regulating the new runway. We said in March that we believe commercial negotiations should be encouraged. Last, perhaps most important, encouraged. We are absolutely not abandoning users and telling airlines simply to see what kind of deal they can reach with the airport. Far from it. But we are keen to see how commercial discussions can support and inform our approach to regulation. Such commercial agreements between airports and airlines are nothing new. Many airports have entered into contracts with airlines to encourage them to open new routes or to grow traffic on existing routes. Airlines can receive lower charges or other benefits if they meet agreed targets for future passenger numbers or future rates of growth. This type of agreement may well have a useful role to play in relation to new capacity because they can help align incentives of both sides to make sure that new capacity is well used and they can provide a stronger story to potential investors or lenders. And we believe there may be a wider role for commercial discussions. If we think about the other components of a regulatory decision covering the new runway, they include levels of charges, timing of revenues, and allocation of key risks, including cost overrun risk. There might be a number of possible trade-offs here. For example, airlines might be prepared to pay a higher airport charge if they receive more protection from cost overrun risk. Or the airport might be willing to accept a lower overall level of charges if the time profile of revenues is brought forward. These are commercial questions, fundamentally, and we believe that parties are well-placed to help find the best solution. They may be able to identify the trade-offs that generate the best value for them or deliver agreements that ensure that risk remains as far as possible with the parties best placed to manage these risks. When I said earlier that we were modest about our intentions here, we recognise that regulators are not necessarily best placed to assess commercial trade-offs. Ultimately, we could take the lead and make all the decisions ourselves, and this remains a real option, and no one will be forced to the negotiating table, but we do see a real opportunity for commercial negotiations to reveal valuable information and to help generate a better outcome than a pure regulatory process. Moving on then to the second issue. Of course, developing a new runway presents challenges well beyond finance and economic regulation. The UK's airspace structure has remained largely the same for 40 years, and a new runway with the extra capacity that brings only strengthens the long-standing need for reform to release the benefits that brings in terms of capacity, safety, and real environmental benefits. Now, Martin Rolfe will be picking up on this theme this afternoon, so I'm going to pass over the substance here. But the reality is that change in the way airspace is used can have a very significant impact on local communities, many of whom will be living uh, a long way potentially from the airport and certainly not in the immediate proximity. And that's why I was heartened by the emphasis the Airport Commission has placed on tackling some of these issues. As we've already heard this morning, opposition from local communities, primarily because of noise, has been perhaps the main obstacle to getting expansion schemes off the ground in the past. This remains the case today, but the strength of feeling amongst communities is perhaps even fiercer than ever. Why? How has noise become so central to the debate on how and where to expand airports in the UK? There is, of course, the simple fact of Heathrow's West London location, which means that uh, many, many more people are affected by aviation noise there than at any other airport. And yet, despite this, or maybe even because of it, it could be argued that the UK historically has been far less innovative than international counterparts in developing ways to reduce aviation noise. There have been some positive changes, of course, for example, work to introduce continuous descents, but there hasn't been the same level of progress on issues such as addressing early morning arrivals, using displaced thresholds for landings, and giving communities enhanced respite, or a real say in noise decisions. And, uh, at the risk of being slightly contentious, if you want evidence for that, note the date at which John Holland Kay wrote to airlines, November last year, not November 10 years ago, or even in the run-up to the 2009 runway scenario. And I do think that that is one of the key issues uh, we are facing. We haven't pushed the boundaries of what is possible for a whole variety of reasons, and not all of those rest with the airport or indeed the airline community. As a consequence, relations with some communities have broken down. Those communities are angry at what they feel is a lack of transparency 
from industry and indeed from the regulator about planned changes to the use of airspace and runways around an airport. And despite some really excellent work recently, as John articulated, there is a perception that industry has broken promises in the past. Compensation is an area where the promoters of recent schemes have all promised to significantly support communities. But both Heathrow and Gatwick have historically been far less generous than other international airports like Schiphol and Frankfurt in funding compensation and mitigation schemes. Something the Commission highlighted the need to address in its final report uh, because it's been a fundamental impediment. Recent promises are a real step forward, of course, but communities will want as a very minimum to see those promises realised before industry can begin to regain trust. And of course, communities are now becoming increasingly more organised in their efforts to expose expansion. They're more sensitive to change than ever, reacting to changes in the way airspace is used to a level we've never seen before. And this despite the fact that modern technology means aircraft are getting progressively quieter. And in becoming more organised, communities have fundamentally enhanced and harnessed the, the power of social media to make their voices heard in a very simple but powerful way. So of course, in this context, building a runway anywhere in the southeast, be it at Heathrow or Gatwick, is not going to be a walk in the park. Nobody should believe that there won't be some losers, even if they are outnumbered by beneficiaries, or that harmonious agreement can ever be reached. But communities affected by significant airport and airspace change do have a right to transparent information to establish that tough decisions are subject to fair scrutiny and challenge. And I believe it's in this context that the, the Commission first proposed in its interim report in December 2013 an independent aviation noise authority. Given my comments about, uh, above, it should be as no surprise to you that the CEA is supportive of the principle of giving communities greater transparency and engagement in debate over major decisions. Indeed, the very idea seemed to win the support of a range of audiences, from communities who want tougher action on noise to the scheme proposers who want to press ahead with expansion. And this, in itself, highlights a challenge. It can't be all things to all people, and different parties have already started to scope their own definition of this body based on their very different needs. And I was interested to hear Andrew Adonis suggest that this might be one of the areas where this debate could uh, regrettably be kicked into the long grass unless we get clarity fairly soon. Now, the Commission has proposed some further clarity in its final report. State in the noise body would be a statutory consultee and provide advice to government and the CAA. I say some clarity because does an authority only provide ad advice or does it have decision-making powers? If so, what decisions can it make and when? If it provides advice, is it in the role of a source of information or an auditor of compliance and fair play? In fairness, the Commission's report does go on to clarify some of these issues, but not all. Why does this matter? Well, for me personally, there are two reasons. Firstly, if we are serious about building trust with local communities, then it's important that there is clarity at an early stage of how such a noise body can support this. And it would be a real shame if its very establishment compounded a sense of mistrust and broken promises. Secondly, it's critically important because, as I've already implied, there are inevitably difficult decisions to be made that involve tough trade-offs. These trade-offs will have to be made at both a national and a local level, weighing up vital issues like delivering economic benefits for the UK as a whole versus the environmental impact of change in the use of airspace on local communities. The cost of reasonable noise mitigation versus the acceptable price of airspace, airport charges. Trade-offs around marginal safety improvements versus noise impact, between minimising noise or carbon emissions. Maybe perhaps trickiest of all, exposing some communities to new regular noise for the first time as a price of reducing overall impact. There are no easy answers here. Whatever the role of a new noise body, they, the CAA, and the promoters will require a clear policy context that will allow decisions around these trade-offs to be taken legitimately and avoid endless battles in the courts. Current legislation and guidance probably isn't sufficient for those tough decisions to be made and stick. This might understandably be unwelcome news for a government already faced with a hugely challenging decision around the runway itself. And I found myself in recent weeks offering an observation that we seem to elect mere mortals 
and somehow conspire to persuade ourselves that through the process of election, they're turned into superheroes with uh, unlimited funds, unlimited stamina, political capital, and bandwidth. Of course, they're not, and that's one reason why we're so often disappointed. The timing of decisions around airspace routines and noise will be important, and we may not be able to resolve all of these in the coming months. They may only ever be resolvable if the aviation industry is prepared to face up to some sacred cows about its own practices, as the Commission's report clearly articulates. But nor should we blindly pursue a path to make fundamental changes to modernise our airspace with all the attendant benefits without key components being in place. The Commission's report is unequivocal about this. It would be like driving at speed into a brick wall and then being surprised at the lasting damage that ensues. For me, those key components that need to be in place can be articulated as follows. First, this level of change demands sponsorship from government, recognising airspace as a vital piece of UK infrastructure and providing the necessary backing to enable industry to del lead delivery changes. It is, in this respect, no different from roads or railways. Secondly, on the back of such sponsorship, there needs to be a much clearer narrative that explains why changes in airspace and new approach is needed, highlighting how changes will improve efficiency and safety while reducing aviation's environmental impact as a whole. This is a narrative that industry and key stakeholder communities must align behind if we are to see through inevitably unpopular decisions. Thirdly, as I've already mentioned, there will need to be a, a, key, a key requirement from government to set some policy leads on issues such as concentration versus dispersal, noise versus CO2, change versus optimization. And finally, we must commit to an improved process, one that communities are able to scrutinize and have a legitimate role in. And that is something that the CAA is ready to lead on alongside a new noise body. Last week's report is a key milestone on what we've already heard is a bumpy road that will require careful navigation. We believe it's a journey worth making, but it's not one that can be made at any cost, either to consumers or, crucially, to local communities. Governments, promoters, airlines, NATS, and the regulator will all need to step up to the mark if we are seriously committed to delivering this time round. Thank you. Question here to start. Thank you. Uh, Paul LeBlanc, International Air Rail Organization. To what extent would a regulatory settlement allow the airport to contribute to surface access, in particular rail schemes? Um, it's entirely plausible uh, that we would, um, if that is a necessary precondition to get uh, planning. Um, then we've had historic precedent for that. I think what we would be reluctant to see is a disproportionate contribution if the vast majority of those benefits actually were, uh, being, uh, were being utilised by other players, but we absolutely believe that if it's a component of planning and the benefit of genuine access to the airport, then it would be perverse not for the regulatory settlement to preclude that. Okay, okay thank you. There was a question just here. Uh, Chris Sergio from Green Air Online. Um, one of the recommendations in the report was for a noise levy and I wondered what the CAA's position might be on such a, such a levy and whether you think, in fact, it could be applied to all UK airports. Um, <clears throat> well, we, in March this year, we published a document called Managing Aviation Noise, uh, and that did set out a whole range of measures, uh, and that, that, that included the provision for, um, uh, for securing funding, in a, if you like, in a direct way. I think what we want to avoid is a money merry-go-round that actually is just really recycling money that's already in the system. But the principle of uh, a levy that we have been particularly critical that the airport charges have, la have lagged the environmental trains. So if you look at the aircraft that pay heavy prices to Heath into Heathrow, those charges almost, tend almost always come in when those aircraft have largely left. So they deal with a tiny fraction. They don't drive airline behavior. And we do think that there's a scope uh, with something like a noise levy to try and drive some airline behavior. Heathrow, for example, is an exceptionally popular airport in the world. Uh, we believe there may be a case to, to use some of that bargaining muscle 
to drive airline behaviour in demanding only some of the uh, uh, most, uh, uh, th those with the lowest noise footprint, for example. Okay, thank you. And uh, a couple of questions here, we'll just take them quickly. So, uh, gentleman here, and then somebody there in the corner. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Eddie Redford from the TUI Group. A follow-on question uh, from the last question. How would the CAA manage the fact that airlines have invested heavily in new equipment, new aircraft? For example, Thomson Airways in the last seven years has replaced 57 of its fleet of 65 aircraft with new, modern, quieter, more fuel-efficient aircraft. So how, how do you manage that with a no in the context of a noise levy? Well, I think it's a good example, Eddie, of what we, we, what we would like to see, potentially, as part, as part of a mix, uh, which is that the differentiation of charges uh, re does recognise and reward good behaviour in terms of uh, new the, the, and the most modern aircraft provided, and they have uh, that noise footprint, as we are aware. New doesn't necessarily just mean best with the, the A320s and some of the uh, retrofitting that's required there, but the principle of the there being a, a, a noticeable differential between quieter aircraft and noisier aircraft, we think is an important one and a means of funding some of the other activity. Thank you. And a, a final question, just uh, over there, right in the corner. Thank you very much. Um, my name's Sally Pavey. I'm from a group called CAGNI, which is Communities Against Gap with Noise and Emissions. So it doesn't really relate to um, Heathrow, but it relates to airspace changes. Um, we know, you, you, I mean, you mentioned continuous descent approach. We know that uh, airspace has been changed on arrivals and has been brought back down much, much lower, which is causing a lot more noise. Now, these actions are taken by NATS uh, without any consultation. Are you looking in your, your key points to be looking that the government will have a policy whereby there are actual controls on NATS because at the moment it seems to be that there aren't any controls that the CAA have over NATS, more that the CAA works hand in hand with NATS. And obviously if they're making changes, then we would like to see the CAA being a body that can actually control NATS. Um, well, well, as you know, this is, we are entering into territory where uh, parties have sought a judicial review against the CAA, so I have to be slightly careful what I say. But I certainly accept the principle that if you're going to do fundamental change, that you need, there needs to be transparency. And we've engaged NATS with a dialogue. This is not a criticism of NATS. NATS are not currently required to assess uh, the local impact in areas which are out with the formal airspace change process. Uh, and uh, we're encouraging NATS to embrace that. Maybe Martin Rolfe will say something about this afternoon. Uh, and we certainly recognise that to have an artificial cutoff at which, if you like, communities are suddenly irrelevant, uh, is not going to facilitate the sort of change this country needs. Okay, Andrew, thank you very much indeed. Thanks a lot. Thank you.